going to continue our series called Keeping It Real. Say, Keep It Real. Keep it real. Oh, I like that. You just keep that up, all right? Amen. In this series, we are telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. No fake news. The truth that I want to share with you today is this everyone struggles. Would you agree with me this morning? Everyone, everyone struggles. In John chapter 16 and verse number 33, Jesus said, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Did you hear what Jesus said? Jesus said that we will have trials and sorrows. Now, everyone's trials are different. Uh, fact of the matter is, a trial for one is a triumph for another. What's easy for some is difficult for others. Some struggle with this while others struggle with that. But the reality is everyone struggles. You know, we tend to look at people in their strengths and, and we tend to assume that they are strong in every area because in their strengths, they're strong. And we look at those strengths and we just assume that they are, they're strong in every area. Uh, we see people as they present themselves. Uh, we assume that their social media presentations are their real life. Uh, when the reality is it's their filtered uh, best side, uh, only post the best of the best, presentation. The truth is everyone struggles with something or in some particular area. Uh, it might be inferiority. Uh, it, it might be depression. It might be jealousy. It could be bitterness. It could be lust. It might be an addiction. And, and the list could go on and on and on. Well, today I want to look at three areas where we could be struggling in. And the first one is this, and that is some struggle with their faith. Yeah, some struggle with their faith. In Mark chapter 9, we find recorded where a certain man admitted that this was his struggle. Yeah, he had a son that was demon-possessed, and, and he brought him to the disciples, but, but the disciples couldn't get the demons out of his boy. So now he brings this boy to Jesus and asks Jesus to deliver his son from these demons. And Jesus said to this man, he said, anything is possible if only you believe. And I love the response of this man. The man replied to Jesus and, and he said to Jesus, I do believe. Yeah, Jesus, I do believe, but I need help with my unbelief. See, this man was struggling with his faith and, right, and rightly so as this was a very serious situation, and the disciples had already failed him. But I ask you this morning, who hasn't struggled in their faith at some point in time? I said, who hasn't struggled in their faith at some point in time? Listen, listen, everyone will have a crisis of faith at some point. If you haven't yet, you will. How's that for a positive confession? Just keeping it real this morning, amen? Amen. Just keeping it real. Well, let me give you three reasons why some struggle in the area of faith. Well, some struggle because of unreasonable expectations. Unreasonable expectations. See, we often struggle in our faith because we set the bar too high for ourselves. We, we try to do in our own strength what is only possible through the help of the Holy Spirit. And then when we fail, we struggle. And in our struggle, we begin to think, what's the use? We begin to, to think, this is too hard. We begin to say to ourselves, I just can't do this. And we would be right. We would be right. We cannot do it on our own. Only through him and only through the power of the Holy Spirit that is at work in us. And then there's the unreasonable expectations that other people place on us. I don't know, perhaps legalism has caused more people to struggle in their faith than just about any other thing. See, everybody has their own ideas of what saints should do and what saints shouldn't do. 
And most of it has to do with handed down traditions and personal convictions rather than clear scripture. And we are often guilty of criticizing somebody else for doing something when we are guilty of something far worse. But not only do some struggle in their faith because of unreasonable expectations, but also because of unanswered questions. Unanswered questions. Bad things happen to good people. And when it does, it often causes some to struggle in their faith. When the drunk driver lives and the saint he hit dies, we struggle with that. When you put in the blood, sweat, and tears to make you qualified for the position and the boss places his lazy, unqualified son there, you're a saint, he's a sinner, we struggle with that. Unanswered questions like these and a host of others will cause some to struggle in their faith. Another reason is because of unreliable saints. Unreliable saints. When sinners look at professing saints who look and act and sound no different than they do, they often struggle with the need of faith. Actor Richard Gere said, I would consider becoming a Christian, he said, if I ever saw a true, pro, a, a true practicing one. Ouch. Let me ask you this this morning. Are you an asset or a liability to Christianity? Yeah. Do you draw people to Christ or do you drive them further away from him by how you live your life? Let me ask you this this morning. Are you, an un, are you an unwavering or unreliable saint? I'm just keeping it real in here today. And the reality is everyone struggles. Some struggle with their faith. Some struggle with their family. The Bible is filled with struggling families. You talk about keeping it real. The Bible keeps it real, right? If you've read the Bible, you'll, you'll see that the Bible keeps it, keeps it real. The Bible is filled with struggling families. It started with the very first family. Adam and Eve struggled with who the head of the family was. As Eve led Adam instead of Adam leading Eve. And the very first murder was committed by a member of the very first family. Family. Mr. and Mrs. Job had some struggles in their family because she refused to stand by her man. And how about the struggles in Isaac's family between the twins, Jacob and Esau? And then Jacob carried on the family struggles as he favored his son Joseph over his other sons, which bred jealousy. And even, even the parable of the family that Jesus told about in Luke chapter 15, there was nothing but struggle in that family between the, the younger son and his father and the younger son and his big brother and the big brother and his little brother and the big brother and the father. The prodigal was restless and big brother was resentful. The prodigal was sensual and big brother was self-righteous. The prodigal was a party animal and Big Brother was full of pride. The reality is every family struggles. Understand this this morning. There are no perfect families. No perfect families. Every family has that crazy uncle that shows up for Thanksgiving and stirs up trouble. There's one in every family. Every family has a prodigal or two in it and a self-righteous big brother or big sister who like to talk about them. Every family with more than one kid in it has to deal with the individual issues that comes with each child's birth order. Whether that be the bossy oldest or the neglected middle or the competitive I'll show you youngest. And there are no perfect marriages. 
Some are better than others, but every marriage has its struggle. Don't, don't, don't be fooled. Just like the old country and Western song says, no one knows what goes on behind closed doors. There are no perfect families. And every family has their share of pain. Every family. Everyone has a story. We look at each other in here, we look, all look pretty good. We all look pretty normal. We all look like we've got it together. But every person in here this morning has a story. If you only knew the story. Everybody has a story. Everyone has or eventually will walk through dark times, discouraging times, disappointing times. Whether it be divorce or whether it be a miscarriage or some dreaded disease, it, it could be a layoff, it could be an unwanted move, oh, different trouble in the family, and on and on and on it could go this morning. Every family has their share of pain. Maybe you weren't affirmed as a child, and so you have sought after affirmation your entire life. Perhaps you have a child that's gone off the rails their actions have caused you much heartache. They're not living the way that you raised them. Maybe you're dealing with an elderly parent with dementia or Alzheimer's. Perhaps there's no greater pain than in seeing your parents turn into totally different people who don't even know their own children. Everybody struggles with some type a family issue. And then also, the third thing I want to say here, and that is that each family member possesses a different personality to balance everything out. I love what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14. The psalmist writes to God and he says, you knit me together in my mother's womb. You made me uniquely, say uniquely. He said, you made me uniquely complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. See, God didn't make us all alike. He didn't make us all alike. We, we didn't come, off a, uh, come from a cookie cutter or off of an, an assembly line. Men and women are polar opposites, and thank God for the difference. And the men said, amen. amen. I've often said, God made Adam, and he looked at Adam, and he said, I can do better than that. And he made Eve, and he sure did. He sure did. God made several different personality types, each one unique and designed for a specific purpose. One type shines brightest as a leader. Another type is best at following. Another type is gifted at design and details, and another is it's just a steady eddy. Not fancy, not spectacular, but reliable, unshakable, willing to do the regular everyday things. Thank God for those kind of people. They just show up every single day. They're dependable. Their highs are never too high and their lows are never too low. And then there's the fun personality. Life of the party. Everything's a party. Never a dull moment. Never too busy to play. A people person. Because of the unique personalities. Each personality sees things differently, which can sometimes cause a struggle. Yeah. See, when it's time to have fun, it's wonderful to have that life of the party, fun person there. But when it's time to get serious, the leader, serious person that wants to drive it forward is frustrated with a fun guy over here having fun when he's trying to be serious. And that steady Eddie, can he move a little bit faster? No, but he will move and keep moving. Hey Amen. How many know what I'm talking about this morning? 
Because of the unique personalities, each personality sees things differently. And that sometimes causes a struggle. You know, that detailed person, can't you see that? No. (laughs) But each personality type is needed and each has something to contribute. There's not a right one. There's not a wrong one. And together they help balance everything out. We're just keeping it real this morning, and today's reality is that everybody struggles. Some struggle with their faith, some struggle with their family, and some people struggle with their finances. I want us to read a story that Jesus told about finances. It's found in Luke's gospel, chapter number 12, verses 15 through 21. should be up on the screen. There it is. And he said, who's he? Jesus. He said, Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. And then he spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do? Since I have no room to store my crops. So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and I will build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? And so is he who lays up treasure for himself is not, and is not rich toward God. Now, when you think about struggling with finances, immediately you tend to think about the lack of finances. And the lack of finances absolutely is a struggle. But there are many, many more struggles in this area than just the lack of them. Fact of the matter is, the man in this story had an abundance of finances, and yet he still struggled in the area of finance. I want to give you three of the many reasons why some people struggle with their finances. Number one, because their assumptions are wrong. They're struggling in the area of finances because, because they have wrong assumptions. See, see, people look at the possessions uh, that other people have and they assume that they are doing far better than I'm doing. They assume that these other people have it all together and are doing so much better in this area. Maybe. Maybe not. Because you see, most Americans today are in debt up to their eyeballs. Wow, they present themselves well. They live in the right neighborhood. They drive the right vehicle. They eat at the right places. But they're in debt up to their eyeball. They don't own anything. They're just in debt. They're playing make-believe. They're playing dress up just like you did when you was a little kid, when you pretended to be a fireman or a policeman or a cowboy. Let's play make-believe. Let's play play dress up. That's what most Americans are doing today with finances. They're saying, let's play make-believe. People also assume that more will make them happy. All they need in order to be happy is just Just a little bit more. I I call it the tug of more. The rich man in the story fought it. His barns were already full. The full barns were not enough. No, no, it's not enough to have full barns. Just a little bit more, he thought. Oh, oh, let me tear down the barns I have and let me build back, build back bigger barns. Yeah, yeah, bigger barns, bigger barns, bigger barns. Bigger barns will make me happy. I'm sure they will. Another assumption that people make is I, I've got a lot of time left to enjoy my finances. 
Let me sit on my finances now and save them up for later. I, I'm not going to give any of it away. I, I'm not going to help anybody out. I, I'm just going to sit on my nest egg until later in life, and then I'll eat and I'll drink, and I will be merry. That's what this man in the story did. But this assumption didn't work out for this man because the Bible says that the death angel came knocking on his door that very night. Another reason why some people struggle with their finances is because their accounting is wrong. Some people just can't count. Uh, you think I'm going one way, that's the next point, but I'm not going that way, but that works too. But some people just can't count. They know the price of everything, but the value of nothing. They know facts and figures, but they have no clue about true value. They work three jobs in order to buy a bigger house, but that leaves them no time to make a home. They work overtime in order to put their kids in a better school and buy them designer clothes, but that leaves them no time to invest personally in them. They envy the Smiths and the Joneses' life, but the Smiths and the Joneses are playing make-believe. They're playing dress-up. They're living a lie. They're living beyond their means. And when the big bad wolf comes to their door and huffs and puffs, he will blow their house down. I'm just keeping it real this morning. And the reality is some struggle with their finances and for various reasons because of their, their assumptions are wrong, because their accounting is wrong, and sometimes because their allocations are wrong. Their allocations. See, for many people, their financial struggle has absolutely nothing to do with the amount but with the allocation. See, if you make $100,000 a year and you spend $120,000 a year, you're still in trouble. I say it like this. If your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall. No matter how much or how little that we make, we must manage it wisely. And I've gone over this several times, but I'm not always going to be here to do this. And so I'm going over it again this morning. Don't forget what I've told you about four things that you should be doing with your money. I'm going to share with you how to handle your money this morning. Four things you ought to do with your money. Number, and in this order, say in this order. In this order. Number one, sow some. Sow some. Tithe offering. Number what? Number one. Put God first. Put God first. Sow some, tithe and offering. Get God's blessing on your money. That's what Malachi chapter 3 says. That if we're a tither, we'll have God's blessing upon our money. Here's what I believe. And a tithe is 10%. I believe that 90% of my income and God's blessing on it is much better than 100% without his blessing. And if you'll read that whole chapter, you'll also find that it doesn't just talk about a blessing. It also talks about a curse that comes on the finances when you don't. But I'm too nice to talk about that. <laughs> Number one, sow some. Number two, save some. Save some. Save some. Why is it that you do all the work but everybody else gets all your money? For most of you, your money is spent before you even get it. You earned it. And everybody else is getting it. Sow some, then save some. Save some. Put some aside for an emergency fund because emergencies are going to come. Oh, you're sure negative today. No, I'm real. We're keeping it real. Yeah. Emergencies are going to come. Yeah. And some things that we call emergencies aren't even emergencies. That's just the regular routine of life. Your tires are going to wear out. That's not an emergency. You knew it was coming. They don't last forever. Right? Sow some, then save some. 
Put something aside for an emergency. And, and invest some for your old age because there's going to be a time when, when, when you're going to be obsolete. And some of you that think you are so, so cutting edge today, well, you might be today, but 20 years from now, you may not be because it's changing so fast. You're not always going to be in demand. You're not always going to be wanted. They're going to move the old guy out and move the new guy in. It's just life. It's going to happen. Do you want to eat Alpo? I don't. I don't even want meatloaf, and that's about the same thing. <laughs> Sow some, save some, and then, say then. Yeah. Then you get to spend some. You start off spending and wonder why you have nothing to give and wonder why you have nothing to invest and you wonder why you have nothing set aside. It's because you got it in wrong orders. No, no, you don't spend till number three. Sow some, save some, then you spend some. Pastor, how much do I get to spend? Less than you make. I believe that as long as you are sowing some and saving some, investing some, and spending less than you make, you're going to be okay. You're going to be all right. I'll never forget going into a banker one time. Many years ago, I wanted to build my own house. And the banker said, you're not a builder. I said, I built three churches. Yeah, but you're not a professional builder. Yeah, but, I, you know, I, I can build a 25,000 square foot church, but I can't build a 2,000 square foot house. And we kind of butted heads a little bit. And he told me, he said, and, and, and I told him how much I wanted to borrow to build my own house. And he said, I'll, I'll loan you twice that much on an already built house. <laughs> what? I said to the banker, I said, you'll loan me this much? He said, yeah. I said, I want to eat. I want to buy clothes for my kids. I want to go on vacation. What? Sow some, save some, spend some, less than you make, and then share some. But not until you've sowed, not until you've saved, not until you've spent, then share some. Luke chapter 6 and verse number 38 says, Give and you'll receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. And it says the amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Takeaway for the message this morning is this. Everyone struggles in some area. Don't allow your struggle to stop you. Here's the good news this morning. I do have good news, and the good news is Jesus wants to help you with your struggle. Did you hear me? Oh, yes, everybody struggles. Oh, yes, that's the reality. That's the truth this morning, but I'm telling you that Jesus wants to help you with your struggle. And let me tell you that he will either help you out of your trouble or he'll help you get through your trouble, but either way, he wants to help you. The question is, will you let him? Will you let him, will you invite him into your struggle? There's a story in the New Testament where the Bible says that, that the disciples were out in a boat on the, on the sea and, and, and there was a storm that came up and, and Jesus hadn't gone with them. He sent them on out ahead of him. And, but, but in the midst of the storm, Jesus comes to them walking on the water. But an interesting phrase in that story, it says that Jesus was walking to them and it says, and he would have passed by. Here they are struggling in the storm, struggling in the boat, and here's the answer come in their direction. But the Bible says that Jesus would have passed them by. See, Jesus is no intruder. He, he, he's not going to intrude on your storm. He's not going to intrude on your trouble. He's not going to intrude on your struggle. He's the answer and he's walking towards you this morning and he's walking towards you on top of the thing that is troubling you this morning. But the reality is unless you invite him into your struggle, he'll walk on by. But the good news is if we'll invite him in, he'll come in 
And that's what happened. The disciples invited Jesus into their boat, into their struggle. Uh, and the Bible says that when Jesus got into the boat, the storm was over. Are you struggling this morning in one of these three areas or another area that I did not mention this morning? Jesus wants to help you. But he's waiting for you to invite him in. 